Hey everyone, welcome back to part two of our asset location video series. In part one of the series, we learned several key concepts about asset location. I admit, while the concepts are important, they aren't so easy to grasp. That's why I encourage most do-it-yourself investors to simply hold the same asset allocation across all account types, ideally with a single asset allocation ETF. However, if a good enough strategy is never good enough for you, our next two videos will have you covered. I'm Justin Bender, Portfolio Manager at PWL Capital in Toronto. In part two of our asset location video series, we'll show you how to increase the expected after-tax return of your ETF portfolio by implementing a traditional asset location strategy. Before we continue with part two of our asset location video series, let's take a moment to review the key concepts we covered in part one you're going to need them to make sense of the next steps. First off, the taxable government portion of your RSP and any growth on this amount never really accrues to you, the investor. It's simply along for the investment ride. Accordingly, the after-tax portion of your RSP acts more like a TFSA. Second, it's your portfolio's after-tax asset allocation, not your before-tax asset mix, that drives your future after-tax portfolio returns. And third, if you prioritize stocks in your RSP, this will make your portfolio's after-tax asset allocation more conservative, since, from an after-tax perspective, you have less invested in stocks than you might think. Likewise, if you prioritize bonds in your RSP, this will make your portfolio's after-tax asset allocation more aggressive, because after-tax, you have less invested in bonds than you might think. Although prioritizing bonds in your RSP will make your after-tax asset allocation inherently more aggressive, which will in turn increase the expected after-tax return of your portfolio, it's important to note this is no free lunch. Even though you may not realize it, you're taking more equity risk from an after-tax perspective. So the higher expected after-tax return of this strategy is your compensation for this additional risk. With that said, this strategy is still a very popular approach to managing a portfolio's asset location. In this traditional asset location strategy, an investor would first choose a before-tax target asset allocation for their overall portfolio, like 60% stocks and 40% bonds. They would then allocate stocks to their TFSA first, non-registered accounts next, and their RSP last. Sorting out the various allocations and locations can get a little messy, so that's why we've called it our ludicrous asset location strategy. And by the way, if you also have corporate investment accounts, the ludicrous asset location order for stocks would be TFSA first, personal non-registered accounts second, corporate non-registered accounts third, and RSP last. In the following asset location examples, we'll compare the after-tax results of our ludicrous portfolio to a light version using the Vanguard Balanced ETF portfolio with ticker symbol VBAL for this purpose. VBAL allocates 60% of its portfolio to stocks and 40% to bonds. So let's start by building out our ludicrous asset location strategy. First, we'll create a three ETF clone of VBAL by separating its underlying stock and bond components. As a proxy for VBAL stock allocation, we'll hold the Vanguard All Equity ETF portfolio with ticker symbol VEQT. For its bond allocation, we'll hold a combination of the Vanguard Canadian Aggregate Bond Index ETF with ticker symbol VAB and the Vanguard Global Aggregate Bond Index ETF CAD Hedged with ticker symbol VGAB. By combining these three ETFs in the correct weights, we'll have identical exposure to VBAL, but with a bit more flexibility so we can locate our individual stock and bond ETFs in different accounts. For both our light and ludicrous strategies, our total before-tax portfolio value will be $1 million, split between a $100,000 TFSA $500,000 non-registered accounts, and a $400,000 RSP. Since our before-tax target asset mix is 60% stocks and 40% bonds, we'll want to allocate $600,000 of the total portfolio to stocks and $400,000 of the total portfolio to bonds for both strategies. In our light asset location strategy, we'll automatically be invested in the same 60% stock, 40% bond asset mix in each account without breaking a sweat. For example, the $100,000 VBAL holding in our TFSA will allocate $60,000 to stocks and $40,000 to bonds, and so on. For our ludicrous asset location strategy, we'll start by allocating $100,000 of stocks to our TFSA. 
We'll then move to the non-registered accounts, where we can allocate $500,000 to stocks, giving us a total stock allocation of $600,000, or 60% of the total portfolio. And moving to the RSP last, we'll allocate $400,000 entirely to bonds, since we don't need to purchase any additional stocks, providing us with our 40% target bond allocation. Now, as we learned in part one of our asset location video series, the taxable portion of your RSP and any growth on this amount is effectively owned by the government. So if we assume a 50% effective tax rate on our RSP withdrawals, the $400,000 before tax RSPs are only worth $200,000 after tax. And if we adjust our asset class figures to account for this, we find our total portfolio value is only worth $800,000 from an after-tax perspective. This doesn't impact the after-tax asset allocation of our light asset location strategy. It remains at 60% stocks and 40% bonds. But it does make our ludicrous asset location strategy more aggressive, with stocks now making up $600,000 of an $800,000 after-tax portfolio. That translates to a 75% stock, 25% bond asset mix after tax. And as we now know, a higher after tax allocation to stocks is expected to result in higher after tax returns. Let's forget we know anything about after tax asset allocation for the time being. As far as a naive investor is concerned, both portfolios are the same, even though their asset location strategies differ. From a before tax perspective, both portfolios should earn the same rate of return as their underlying investment strategies are the same. To put this to the test, let's assume stocks return 6% and bonds return 2% over the next year, with no rebalancing in either portfolio. At the end of the year, our stocks have increased from $600,000 to $636,000, and our bonds have increased from $400,000 to $408,000. From a total portfolio perspective, both strategies would have grown to the same before-tax portfolio value of $1,044,000 and yielded the same before-tax return of 4.4%. Investors in either strategy would be indifferent between the two outcomes, at least before taxes are considered. Now, let's take things one step further and pay all taxes owing to the government, including the taxes eventually owing on the RSP. We'll assume a 50% effective tax rate on all taxable income, and we'll also assume stocks have a fully taxable dividend yield of 2%, and the remaining 4% of the stock return will be taxed at a capital gain with a 50% inclusion rate. The 2% bond return will also be fully taxable as income, along with the entire market value of the RSP on deregistration. After paying all taxes owing at the end of our one-year period, we find the ludicrous asset location strategy outperformed the light asset location strategy by 0.3% after tax. But as we already know from part one, this outperformance is explained by after-tax asset allocation, not asset location. That is, the ludicrous portfolio actually had a riskier after-tax asset allocation of 75% stocks, 25% bonds. So, you now know how to implement a traditional asset location strategy to increase the future expected after-tax return of your portfolio. From a behavioral standpoint, the more complicated, ludicrous asset location strategy does have its benefits. As far as the average investor is concerned, the portfolio remained a 60% stock, 40% bond portfolio on paper. The investor's account statements and performance reports would reflect the same, as they are all reported before tax. Even though you now technically know better, you may still want to take this approach. It can be a great way to trick your brain into thinking you're taking the same amount of risk while increasing your expected after-tax return at the same time. There are so few opportunities in investing where irrational behavior can work to your benefit, but this is one of the exceptions. So that's an advantage of going ludicrous, but there are also several disadvantages to ditching your single asset allocation ETF. First, it's more complicated. Even though a three ETF portfolio may seem simple, Nothing beats a single asset allocation ETF in terms of simplicity. Second, you'll be taking more after-tax equity risk. Even though it may not feel like it, know that you're sharing less of the portfolio risk load with the government relative to holding the same asset mix across all accounts. Third, you'll need to rebalance your portfolio. Anytime you add new money to the portfolio or withdraw funds from it, you'll need to review all accounts in your spreadsheet and determine which trades need to be placed. 
You'll do so on a consolidated portfolio rather than on an account by account basis. Vanguard also rebalances their asset allocation ETFs whenever an underlying asset class becomes 2% over or under its target. This means you'll need to be extremely diligent with your rebalancing thresholds if you want to closely track the returns of a comparable single asset allocation ETF before taxes. For example, VBEL returned 10.2% during the 2020 calendar year. But if you failed to rebalance your multi ETF portfolio during 2020, you would have realized a return of only 9.65% before tax. Fourth, your accounts will perform differently from one another. During bull markets, you might be asking yourself why your bond heavy RSP is doing so poorly. And during bear markets, you'll wonder why your TFSA and taxable accounts are underperforming your RSP. In other words, if you tend to view the performance of your accounts in isolation, you may want to stick with an asset allocation ETF. And finally, expect more capital gains. If you can't keep your portfolio in balance by injecting new cash into it when needed, you may need to instead rebalance periodically by selling equities in your taxable account, realizing capital gains in the process. If these disadvantages don't intimidate you, perhaps a ludicrous asset location strategy could make sense for your portfolio. But what if you wanted to pursue higher expected returns specifically from your asset location decisions and not just from taking on more after-tax equity risk? Coming up in part three of our asset location series, we'll look at a more modern take on asset location. Make sure you subscribe to the channel to receive notifications as new videos are released. And thanks again for tuning in. I'm Justin Bender of PWL, and this is the Canadian Portfolio Manager YouTube channel. See you next time.